Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to User Education. So today we will solve uh, problems uh, which uh, I, I would classify as logical problems. So this is um, the lecture number five in this department of logic. Um, now this is part of the course called Math Plus and Problems presented on Unizor.com. Well, this is a continuation of the main theoretical course, which is called Math for Teens on the same website. Well, there are other courses as well, like Physics for Teens and Relativity for All, etc. So, basically, my purpose was, after the theoretical uh, course called Math for Teens, I wanted to, uh, to present certain problems which are not exactly like illustration for the theory, but rather to force you to think creatively outside of the box. Basically to develop your analytical abilities, logical abilities, um, creativity and uh, factors which are really very much needed in the real practical uh, life. Obviously none of the problems which I present here are of any kind of practical sense, well, almost none of them. Um, but, again, this is just a gym for your brain. This is exercise for your inner powers. Okay, so after... Uh, yeah, I didn't really mention that everything on Unizor.com is totally free. There are no advertisement, um, no strings attached. Uh, you don't even have to sign in if you are uh, just studying uh, alone, just for yourself. Uh, if you're supervised uh, in, in your studying, then we need something like a relationship between the supervisor and, and, and the student, and then there is a need for signing. But again, it's just signing, like name and password, and that's it. Okay, so logical problems. And uh, these logical problems are not really very difficult, but they have some kind of a twist which might be you know, interesting. And uh, what's very important is I will present the problem, but before I start the explaining how I would solve it, I would suggest you to pause the video and try to solve it yourself. Alternatively, you can go to the website and every lecture has a textual part, which is basically like a textbook, where I present the problem not necessarily with solution. I mean, I'm talking about the problems of this course. So in some cases, I just give a hint in the textual part of this lecture. So it might actually make sense for you, before you even start listening to the lecture, go to the website and uh, see what the textual part is. There is a problem, uh, a presented problem, and um, try to solve it yourself maybe there is a hint, use the hint. Sometimes I do present solution as well in the textual part, sometimes not. The solutions are for the lectures actually. All right, so I have um, five problems, so let's start. The first problem, okay, imagine uh, let's say a casino and casino manager is analyzing um, uh, how many times people uh, win in roulette for whatever purposes, management purposes, to extract more money from the people. So let's say that he finds out that n one number of people during, let's say, a day has won one or more times and two people has won two or more times during the day, etc. And n, lowercase n people actually equals to n. That's the maximum. Nobody won more than n games during the day. Now, that's what he knows from whatever sources, doesn't really matter. Now, what he does want to know is how many times Casino lost. Again, 
absolutely artificial conditions because it's much easier for him to know how many times Casino lost just asking Croupier or whoever. But in any case, it's a logical problem, it's math. So this is the problem and we have to solve it. So again, n one people greater than one game and two people greater than two, etc. Now obviously n one is greater than n two because among people who won one or more there are definitely people who won two or more and n2 is greater than three etc and, and n is the smallest number of people who won the maximum number of games which is n okay how can we solve this problem so again pause the video think about it yourself now before doing this actually one second i will give you an answer the answer is n1 plus n2 plus etc plus nn now when i solved the problem and found that's the result and checked it against the answer in the book actually um, i was kind of surprised because it looks like the number of people who are in the group of people who want one or more is basically ev everybody from this group is contained here everybody on this group is contained there etc so that was kind of a surprising answer for me nevertheless it's true okay now you can pause the video and i will um, explain the solution um, okay let's about let's think about it this way if m1 people won one or more games and two people won two or more games. How many people won just one game? Well, obviously, it's the difference between these two. These people won one game. Now, let's talk about two people, uh, two, two games. How many people um, won just exactly two games? Well, if M2 won two or more and n3 won three or more so the difference between them is number of people who won two games so this number of people won one game this won two game well obviously i can continue this and let's say um n Uh, let's say n minus 2 minus n n minus 1 1 n minus 2 game n minus 1 minus n n 1 n minus 1 game and n n people exactly n games as we saw exactly so this is number of people who won one game, this number of people who won two games, exactly. So, how many people actually, uh, how many games this won n minus one minus n minus two games, this won n minus two minus n minus three times two, because each one won two games, right? This one was n minus 2 minus n minus 1 times n minus 2 games. Then n minus 1 minus n n n minus 1 games and plus n n times n. So if we will summarize, this is number of games which were won by people and lost by casino. Okay, so what's the sum of this? All right, look at it this way: n one minus n two plus two n one minus two n three plus three n three minus three n four. Look at this. This is n two. This is n three this is n4 etc and what will be at the end so everything goes with the previous one 
So this is n minus 1 times n minus 2 and it's with a minus. This is n minus 1 times n minus 1 with a plus. So it will be n minus 1. Uh, and uh, minus n times n minus 1 plus n times that times n n, so it would be n n. So this is exactly n n one and two and three and four and minus one and, and, and exactly like I told you in the very beginning. That's it. Next problem. Next one is easy. So let's talk about chess, chess game. Well, not exactly chess game, but just one particular um, uh, aspect of the chess game. So there is a rook. Rook goes vertically or horizontally, as we know, right? Now there are eight by eight squares on the chess board. So my question is, how many rooks can you put onto the chess board in such a way that every rook can go left and right or up and down without hitting another rook. Okay. Uh, let's say we can put it on diagonal. It would be eight rook, eight rooks. So obviously each one can go all the way up and down, right? Without disturbing each other. Is it a maximum? Yes, it is a maximum, obviously, because since you have only eight rows, let's say, and obviously you, you, ha you have to have no more than one rook in a row, that's, that, that's your maximum. So eight is your maximum. So we know how to position eight rooks so they don't disturb each other. They can go freely up and down without hitting um, anybody else. And uh, obviously this is the maximum. So this is a very simple problem. But I, I wasn't really presenting this problem for this problem, just for the next problem. Next is a little bit more interesting. Well, it's the same story with rooks. And uh, right now we are talking about maximum of eight rooks putting on the board. And my question is, let's numerate the uh, squares on the chessboard. One, two, three, eight. Uh, 9, 10, etc., 16, and up to 64. So we have 64 squares and every square has a number. Now my question is, what if you position 8 rooks exactly as before, I mean no rook is preventing another rook to go up and down all the way to the edge of the, of the board. My question is, what's the sum of the numbers uh, which are where the rooks are positioned? Well, uh, in this particular case, if we have diagonals, diagonals have number, what, 1. Then next one will be, uh, this is 9, so this is 10. Uh, and it, I always add 9, right? So 19, uh, 28, etc. So if you will summarize them somehow, you will get some kind of a number. Okay. Now. But we can position rooks differently. For instance, we can position along this diagonal, or we can position it somehow this way, in some order, whatever the order we can put in, in such a way that they do not really prevent each other from movement, we can position them. And obviously, we can calculate the sum of the numbers. What is this sum of the numbers? Does it depend? on how we position our rooks or not. Well, think about this. Pause the video and I will tell the result of this. Well, the result of this is that the sum will be always the same. 
again kind of unusual answer you position it differently but the sum of the numbers will be the same so let's calculate this number okay here's how we can calculate it. now we consider we put um, we have eight rooks eight rooks so we will have row number and column number row number and column number of every rook so I put index i where i is equal to 1, 2, etc. 8 ok so we have this now what is the number associated with a square which has coordinates ri and ci well that's kind of easy thing because obviously it's ri minus 1 times 8 plus ci if the row is equal to 1 and column equals to 1 so it will be 1 minus 1 which is 0 times 8 plus 1 let's say we have the very last one 8 8 so what we will have 8 minus 1 times 8 plus 8 which is 56 64 obviously so this is the right number something like this number this is the last row is equal to 8 and column is equal to 1 now if this is 64 this is 57 right uh, so let's try if r is equal to 8 and c is equal to 1 56 plus 1 57 yes that's the correct formula and then obviously the number of row minus 1 should be multiplied by 8 the number of uh, elements in a row and then plus the column number so that's fine okay formula we have now let's summarize r i minus 1 times 8 plus c i i from 1 to 8 so what we will have well we will have um, uh, 8 times sum of ri minus 1 plus sum of ci now let's think about it from the previous problem we know that every rook has its own row and no two rooks are supposed to be in the same row because otherwise they would be they would disturb each other in their movement same thing with column no rooks should be in the same column so all the C's must be different now what are the C's value it's one or two or three etc or eight now they're all different they might be from one to eight so this sum is basically independent it's basically sum of one plus two plus etc plus eight whatever it is now this is exactly the same all our eyes are supposed to be unique because no two rooks are supposed to be in the same row which means when you will summarize it it will be well our i is from zero to one so our i minus one is from zero to seven so it's uh, one plus uh, zero plus one plus etc plus seven so that would be times eight plus this and if you will not if you will calculate it will be 260 so again no matter what's the order of our eyes and c eyes they must be different which means they are our i minus one should be from zero to seven all the different values in maybe a different order but the sum would be exactly the same all right so that's it next problem by the way this was also kind of unexpected result that no matter how we put all these rooks the sum would be the same okay now another kind of strange result you have two cups one is coffee another is milk absolutely the same cups and the same amount of liquid in both cups 
Then what we do is we take a spoon, take the spoon of milk, put into the coffee, stir it, and then take whatever the mixture is and put it back into milk. That's it. Now my question is, where the concentration is greater, milk in coffee or coffee in milk? Stop the video, pause the video, think about it, and I will tell you the result. Well, the concentration would be the same. Now, why is it the same? Well, again, it's logic, basically. Think about it this way. Whatever we mixture, whatever we mix together, doesn't really matter. But as a result, the amount of liquid is the same, right? Because we took the spoon here and spoonful back. So the amount remains the same as it was in the beginning. But there is a mixture. But think about it this way. Whatever the amount of milk we took and put into coffee, if the amount of coffee is, I mean, amount of mixed coffee and milk is the same, it means exactly the same amount of coffee we put into the milk. So after these two uh, transformations, or maybe it's four, maybe we did it again and again and again, back and forth, back and forth. The amount in both cups will be the same. Amount of coffee and milk was the same in the very beginning, which means that amount of coffee in milk should be exactly the same proportion as, as milk in, 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 in the coffee. Well, that's, that's your answer. Although in the beginning you think that, okay, we put the pure milk into the coffee, but back into the milk we, we put the mixture of coffee and milk, so it does seem to be disturb the, the balance, but no, it doesn't disturb, because again, whatever amount of milk is here is exactly the same amount of coffee is there, because the level remains the same. Okay. Okay, and my last problem. Let's say you have a table. Rows, columns, whatever. Now, there are numbers in this table, some numbers, but what's known is that every number, let's say this one, is arithmetic average of its neighbors, where it actually shares the border. So this is, we don't have diagonals, no, just up and down or left and right. Now, if you have this, for example, number that's average of this and this and uh, if you have let's say this number it's average of these these and these these are neighbors so every number is average of its neighbors now prove that all the numbers must be the same in this table otherwise you cannot really have this thing really arranged in such a way that every number is the average of its neighbors where it shows the border okay how can we prove it again pause the video and think about it it's actually very simple now we are talking about table with certain finite number of numbers which means there is a maximum number we can start with a minimum or maximum doesn't really matter let's start with a maximum number so whatever the maximum number is doesn't really matter whether it's in the corner or in the border or in the center of the board. If it's average of its neighbors, but this is the maximum number, how can maximum number be the average of its neighbors? Only in one particular case, if they are all equal to this maximum number. Because whenever you have any number 5, if it's an average of two different numbers, let's say 2 and 8, either one should be less and another should be greater, or they are both the same. But this is the maximum, that's what we started with maximum, so we cannot have something like this, which means only this case remains. And it doesn't matter whether it's only 2, if it's on the corner, of, or if it's 3, let's say 5, you have 3, uh, 2 and uh, what? Uh, we have to have 15, right? So it's 10. Same thing. 
this is average of these three numbers 3 plus 2 plus 10 is 15 divided by 3 is 5 correct but if this is maximum we cannot have this case so if the if, if a maximum number which is greater than everything else or equal to everything else uh, is average of its neighbors neighbors must be equal okay so if this is the maximum let's say this is then its neighbors must be the same now we can start repeating this thing again and again and again and this thing would grow and grow and grow to all directions it must be the same and gradually we will fill up the whole table we will prove that basically all the table all, all the numbers in this table are exactly the same as the one we started with so if we start with minimum it would be exactly the same thing um, which means if we start with minimum and this this is minimum there is nothing less than uh, th than this minimum which means uh, the neighbors must be equal to this number and then we go again and again and again all right so these are all the problems i wanted to present to you today um, i would suggest you to read the notes for this lecture go to unisor.com go to course called math plus and problems and uh, there is a logic section and this is uh, number 05 you will see it and uh, read the notes for this lecture all the problems are presented there um, I'm not sure I present I don't think I presented the solutions but I do have some hints in there so I would suggest you just to repeat the same thing use the hints and come up with your own decision solution analysis whatever logic okay that's it for today thank you very much and good luck